Hey everyone, hello, is it Wednesday now? Yeah, it's Wednesday now, good to see you. I don't know if everyone's here yet. It's My, my screen is only able to show the 25 people who joined first. I guess that's sort of analogous to going into a classroom. I, it just occurred to me that the way to get a front row seat is to show up first. I go, although I guess it doesn't really matter. Oh, it's so funny. So when I'm talking about this, usually when you think about it, the front row seat is like then you guys can see the teacher or the professor. Uh, but from the point of view of teaching, the front row is like how we can see who is like responding the most. So th it's just funny. For me, the front row seat are the people that I see, right, that I see first. So I guess I'm used to thinking of it from the other perspective. Ah, what platform are you on? Gallery view. Yeah, yeah, I'm on some gallery view. Actually, I haven't figured out yet whether it's possible to spread the gallery view over multiple monitors. Uh, actually, is that possible? Does anyone know? If you have like two screens, can you have the gallery view go across two screens? Maybe someone will tell me. Make the window really big. What do you mean? It's like the full screen. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's like it's the full screen right now. I can see twenty-five people. But um, uh, from this uh, from this place I'm streaming from, I have gigabit internet. So there's no reason not to just like see everyone. Then I can do a better job teaching. So that's what I would do on Google Hangouts because Google Hangouts doesn't limit the number of times you can go and see it. Zoom for me has. Somehow if I log in on Zoom on another instance, it says you're already logged in. Oh, I can do it. I can log in. You can? Okay, then I need to try this. I need to try this because uh, that, would be, that, would be, that would be neat. Okay, cool. Well, hopefully by now people are here. So let's continue and start talking about the class. So uh, where were we last time? Well, we were talking about this uh, Dirichlet approximation theorem. So let me see, let me go to this. Then I can do some drawing. Oh, I see, I was just giving a talk somewhere else. So I had my screen with some filters. Let's put that back. Okay. Right, so we were doing this Dirichlet approximation theorem. And let's just remember again, what was the, the cool fact that we are, that we're gonna prove. I'm gonna write down one of the facts and then I'll write down the stronger fact just to put us all in the same memory space as we were last time. So there was this Dirichlet theorem. And what this said is if you had any real number for any real number, alpha, uh, there exists infinitely many ways to approximate this with a fraction. There exist infinitely many PQ choices which are integers such that 
if I look at the distance between alpha and this fraction p over q, this is less than or equal to 1 over q squared. So that was cool. That was like we can approximate numbers pretty darn well, uh, and we can do it a lot of times. We can, we can, we can always approximate the number with, with like more and more of these fractions that get uh, bigger and bigger denominators, and they have errors that get smaller and smaller. And the route towards doing this, we showed that there's a stronger theorem, which I also attributed to Dirichlet, which says that uh, for any real number, there's not, and, and for any capital N now, so for any real number and any capital N, which is a positive integer, uh, there exists P and Q, which are integers, such that now we have two conditions. One is that this, can I fit it all on one slide, uh, on one screen? No, I'll put it on the next line. Such that the distance between alpha and p over q, this is at most 1 over q times n, and the q is between 1 and n. Okay, and we, s we showed why this second green theorem implied the yellow theorem. That was what we did, one of the things we did last time. And then what we did right before the end is we translated this green theorem into another theorem, which I guess I can write, well, not another theorem, I'll, I'll say this entire condition got translated into same as, does anyone remember what it was? It was like almost like English phrase. Just type raise hand or something. It's faster than typing the whole thing in. Yeah. I just realized that I have my audio, so I can't hear you. Just a second, not your fault. Not your fault. Wait a second. No? I should be able to hear you. Ah, OK, OK, OK. <laughs> We're good. <laughs> Great. One of. Um, 1 alpha, 2 alpha, 3 alpha, all the way to n alpha is within plus or minus 1 over n of an integer. OK. Now, quick question. It has 1 alpha all the way to n alpha. What if I had 0 alpha? Would it be easy to prove if I had 0 alpha as an option? Well, yes, I, well, I mean, it's not equivalent, but like zero alpha is an integer no matter what. So if you're wondering, like, what is this one alpha up to n alpha, it's quite nice. It's like, don't start with zero alpha, that's dumb. But from like the one alpha and keep going at, up to n of them, then like one of them is within one over n of an integer. Okay, so now how do we prove this? Well, so far it might have looked like all we're talking about is like number theory or real numbers or something, but it turns out that the heart of this proof uses combinatorics, and Adivate wants to say a comment. Okay, I have to define the pigeonhole principle, okay? Pigeonhole, how do you spell pigeonhole? Pigeonhole principle. So by the way, pigeonhole principle does not have a D in pigeon. Ah, uh, that's a uh, pigeon English or something, right? But so, so this is pigeon with a P-I-G-E-O-N. Pigeonhole principle is very easy to state. Um, it says if you have N pigeons, and n plus 1 holes, then some pigeon has more than one hole. It's true. I mean, I'm sure, that, I'm sure that everyone is used to thinking of it in a slightly different way. Of um, Usually it's like you have n pigeons and n minus 1 holes, then one hole has at least uh, two pigeons in it, but it's equivalent. Okay, but the, 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 the bottom line is that it's like too much stuff to fit in too little space. Now, this is, turns out to be the, the, the fundamental idea here. Brayden, you were going to say something too. Uh, yeah, I was going to say similar things. 
Okay. Pigeonhole, pigeonhole. So how can we get some pigeonhole principle here? I always just think of pigeonhole principle, like the, all these fancy words is just like too much stuff for too little space. Okay? That's how I always think of the pigeonhole principle. So then I have to think about stuff and space. And actually, it's funny. A lot of people say things like, I have this many pigeons, I have this many holes. What are the holes and what are the pigeons? Uh, the way we're going to do it here is I have these numbers, 1 alpha, 2 alpha, up to n alpha. Well, if we're talking about distance from an integer, a very natural thing to do is actually to draw the number line as a circle. OK? And this is like a fun idea. So you can actually think of the numbers draw the numbers like on a on a circle like a, like a clock okay we can draw the number line as a circle and sometimes people might even think of this with notation as r slash z um, the way you pronounce the slash is mod so uh, this is like somehow some people sometimes think of it. It's like you might see it somewhere in math, like r mod z. Um, and what that means is it's the real numbers where all of the integers are identified. Like all the integers are the same somehow. And the way this looks is you have a circle. Okay. And I'll think of things going clockwise. So let's label the circle with a few numbers. So for example, if I wanted to know where is the number 42. The number 42 is at the top right here. The significance of 42 is it's 42.0. Okay? But I can draw other numbers on this. I could decide, I, I might want to know where is like 7 over 2. Well, 7 over 2 is over here. That's like, well, what is it? 3 and a half, right? So it's like halfway around the circle. If I want to know where is pi, pi is 0.14. 0.14 is close to 0.16666. That's one sixth. So in that case, I think that pi lives on the circle somewhere around here. How about square root 2? Square root 2 is 1.414. And 1.414, uh, maybe that's going to be 0.4-ish. So 0.5 is if I've gone all the way over to here. Maybe 0.4 is somewhere there. Maybe. 1.414. I'm just trying to approximately say what this looks like. This, maybe this is square root 2. Is my picture making sense? I'm, I'm like, I have this big circle, and I can draw my number line. Uh, ooh, what's this? 22 over 7. Yes. <laughs> OK, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. Pi is around 22 over 7. That's true, too. So, so, so you know, we have all of these different numbers that we can write on this number circle, all right? So why did I bother doing this? The reason I bothered doing this is you can just think of your numbers as going around a circle. And every time you get to a full one, it goes around. Oh, I, I forgot to write negative numbers. Let's put a negative number. Let's put minus 1.25. And I'm doing that on purpose to show that minus 1.25 is here. And that's because when you go minus, you know, minus is going the other way. It's anti-clockwise. And minus one full anti-clockwise circle and a minus a quarter. Right? So you can have positive numbers and you can have negative numbers on this circle. OK. So the next thing I want to do is I want to think about what happens if I draw the same circle, but I put the numbers 1 alpha, 2 alpha, 3 alpha, up to n alpha on the circle. So I'm going to get to a, a new screen. This was just one demonstration. New screen is now let's draw 1 alpha, 2 alpha, all the way to n alpha on the circle, this circle r mod z. OK? So what does that look like? So if I have all of these things, these are, these are numbers, actually, they should, they should satisfy some nice uh, periodicness. So I'm going to actually write the 0 alpha just because that's 0, OK? This is 0 at the very top. It also happens to be 0 alpha, but that's not one of the numbers I'm trying to write. I'm trying to write 1 alpha, 2 alpha, and so on, OK? So let's try to draw 1 alpha somewhere. Maybe this is 1 alpha. Can anyone tell me, geometrically, if that was 1 alpha, if I said, oh, you know, if that's 1 alpha, this is 2 alpha, what's wrong with what I just drew? 
What I just drew is bogus. It's obviously bogus, and why? Just type raise hand or something. Raise hand, elevate. Suppose we evenly spaced, right? Because if I'm going around the circle like a clock, when I go from 0 alpha to 1 alpha, that's there, and going another alpha should go the same distance. Is that clear? Like, because this is just like, imagine a number line. You can't have the number 0, the number 1 alpha, and then suddenly like 2 alpha all the way over there. It has to be equally spaced. So it is not here. Oh, let's do undo instead. It's not there. Instead, it should be sort of equally spaced, maybe something like this, 2 alpha. And then you keep going. So there's 2 alpha, and then there's 3 alpha, and they're all equally spaced. OK. Now, n might be huge, by the way. n might be like 100. So you know what's going to happen. You're going to go all the way around, and you're actually going to wrap around. Is that making sense? It's going to go all the way around. It's not going to stop before the end if n was like 100. It will keep going around. Just a second. Keep going, and you wrap around. OK. Now, as you're wrapping around and wrapping around and wrapping around, maybe at some point I'm going to get some other things that will show up. Like, as it's wrapping around, maybe I, I, I'm going to use another color. Maybe over here I suddenly got to, I don't know, um, 37 alpha. Is that making sense? Like, suppose I got to 37 alpha, and then there should be a 38 alpha somewhere over here. The distances should all be the same. Yeah, so I, I just thought I'm going to go around. You may notice that actually before I should have had some stuff too. Like if there was this 37 alpha, there has to be a 36 alpha before it. I'm just going to draw it here. Does anyone notice anything geometrically that should be true? Like why I was so careful to put 36 alpha there? Any other fun geometric things about what we've drawn? Just like any observation of Anything's being equal. Is it? Oh, it doesn't ask me my hand from before. Oh, oh, okay, okay. Chris. Uh, so you pull out two of the blocks and it's a little bit left. So if you go around, whatever it is, three times, it's a little bit left. Okay, so you said like. <laughs> 2 o'clock is a little bit less. That's true. That's true. Are there any other geometric coincidences? I'm just like looking for simple stuff. It doesn't have to be big stuff. Uh, ooh, Suvik. Um, so the distance between uh, 36 alpha and 2 alpha is the same as the distance between 37 alpha and 2 alpha. Does that make sense to people? Yeah, so, so th th that's also true. I mean, this is also true. These two distances are equal. And why are they equal? It's because what have you done? You have just turned the clock back by an alpha. Does that make sense? Like, whatever these look like, if I just turned back the clock by alpha, of course, it will look like that. This is an important observation. So an important observation is that somehow these distances are same by turning back the clock by alpha. OK. We're getting close to a pigeonhole principle, except that we don't have any pigeons or holes yet, in the sense that we don't have any subdivision of this space. So uh, I have here like a number circle. And it turns out that the pigeonhole principle here is a bit tricky. It ends up being something where I will want to break the space into n parts. That's going to be useful. And then we're going to try to find out what happens when you have two things landing in the same part. Actually, the 0 alpha turns out to be a useful thing. We'll leave the 0 alpha. The way to think of this is this was a circle. Now imagine what happens. I'm going to go to a new screen. Okay, So now that we understand this piece, let's go to a new screen and say, OK, now we're actually going to draw 0 alpha as well as 1 alpha 2 alpha all the way to n alpha on r mod z, where it's um, split into intervals of width, that's ugly, width 1 over n. 
I just want to write more clearly. Width 1 over n. Specifically, let's go and draw this r mod z, this circle. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have some, some uh, intervals. The first interval starts at 0, and it goes for 1 over n. So this is 0, and this is at 1 over n. Now notice I used a square bracket, and I used an open, oh, I just gave away what it was. I used a round bracket and a square bracket. And what those mean is one is a closed endpoint and one is an open endpoint. So the, the, the square bracket means including 0. And the open, the, the, the round, and, uh, round bracket means that this particular interval goes from 0, and it goes up to 1 over n, but not quite. It doesn't include 1 over n. Is that all right? Like These are half open intervals. Why I did that is I want to draw another one. The next one is going to go from closed also at 1 over n to 2 over n. And we're going to do this all the way around. I'm going to go and get, I'm going to go and get n intervals. OK, so we go all the way around, get n intervals. All right, I wanted to use the pigeonhole principle. And here I decided to throw all the numbers from 0 alpha to n alpha into here, into this picture. The pigeonhole principle then guarantees for me that there is some interval which has two of these in it, at least. Is that OK? Because if I look at these n plus 1 numbers, and I have these n intervals, at least one interval has more than one of those numbers in it. Pigeonhole implies um, there exists. OK, I'm going to write it backwards, E. We'll see that more and more in this class. Uh, that just stands for there exists. There exists an interval with more than one of these n plus 1 numbers. Why is that relevant? So uh, suppose I have an interval with more than one of these numbers. Adivate, what do you see? OK, let's use that. Exactly. We want to turn back the clock. That's why I was giving that hint about turning back the clock, right? So you'll get something, and there exists this interval. And maybe it's over here, which is what I've just drawn here. And maybe the two numbers that are in it are you know, weird or something. Maybe this guy is, uh, maybe this was 7 alpha. And maybe this thing here was, uh, I don't know, 22 alpha. OK, I just made something up. I was like, he's got these two things, and these two things are both in the same 1 over n interval. Well then, what that means is, now let's start turning back the clock. If you, if we, we just found out that these two numbers are within 1 over n of each other. So if I turn back the clock, the distance between 6 alpha and 21 alpha is also less than 1 over n. All right, so the way this works is we got this thing. Um, this gets two multiples of alpha within 1 over n of each other. That's actually the key fact. It's like they're both in the same interval. That means that their distance apart is actually strictly less than 1 over alpha, uh, 1 over n. It's strictly less than 1 over n. What does that mean? So it's like, for example, if it was 7 alpha distance to 22 alpha. But now the key is that's the same distance as turning back the clock. That's why I emphasized in the previous 
picture, if you just subtract alpha from each number, then you have the same distance. 6 alpha to 21 alpha is the same distance. Also, it's actually strictly less than 1 over n. I mean, I wrote my theorem as less than or equal to 1 over n, but it's actually, it's actually strict. Um, you can get better. It's even, it's even better. If someone asks you to prove less than or equal and you prove less than, uh, well, it's also less than or equal. Why is it so interesting to turn back the clock? Can anyone tell me how we would get to the end? The end is supposed to be that uh, some multiple of alpha is within 1 over n of an integer. How do you finish this proof? I turn back the clock once. Aha, let's get another fresh idea. Sean. Bam! Turn it back, uh-huh, uh, yeah. uh until it's zero against whatever. Oh no, if I only I could subtract. What is this? This is the hardest, 15 alpha, okay? And it's also same distance less than one over n. But what's zero alpha? It's zero! Boom! Zero alpha is zero. And so what you just found out is that there's some multiple of alpha which is really close to an integer. Is that okay? Like zero alpha is like right there, that corresponds to integers. So what this is telling you is actually, if I looked at this picture, I can draw for you in this exact picture, where is 15 alpha? Oh, 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 this is neat. In this particular picture, you're seeing an example of a negative. Uh, can anyone tell me where I should draw the 15 alpha in this picture? I have a seven alpha and a 22 alpha. Where should the 15 alpha look? Roughly, where should I draw a 15 alpha? Subhashish. Uh, exactly. This is where the 15 alpha is. And the important thing is that these two distances should be the same. I'll even draw arrows. Is that okay? It's like from the 7 alpha, you rewind the clock a little bit to go to the 22 alpha. And then that means that from the 0 alpha, you should rewind a little bit to get to the 15 alpha. I'm just emphasizing that where it sits, it could be to the left. It doesn't have to be to the right. But it's still really close to 0, meaning that it's really close to an integer. Okay. So what we have just found out is, so 15 alpha is within plus or minus 1 over n of an integer. Okay, so now let's look a little bit about what we're trying to prove. Remember we were trying to prove that there is always going to be some multiple of alpha from 1 alpha up to n alpha, which is within 1 over n of an integer. We have to check that, you know, this is, this is just one example. This is just one example with some numbers like 7 and 22. How do I know this satisfies the conditions? If I do this procedure, how do I know that whenever I finish, I always will get a number like 15? How do you know that this number, how do you know this final um, multiplier is in the range from 1, 2, up until capital N? That's like the only thing left that we have to explain. Brayden. Uh, well, we know that we've drawn out 0 alpha to n alpha. And this integer that we're going to find is going to just be the difference of the coefficients of alpha that you get. Uh, and since we're moving from 0 alpha to n alpha, the difference just has to be between 1 and n. Brilliant. So the key is that this number, this 15 here, is actually the difference between the two. That's actually why there's this counterintuitive point of why did we throw 0 in there? The reason we threw zero alpha in there is just so that the differences between any number and any other number, the differences would range from one alpha up until n alpha. That's where zero came in handy. Okay, so yeah, the answer. Since the multiplier is the difference between uh, the two numbers from 0, 1 up until n. 
And if I take the difference between two numbers in that range, I get a number from 1 up until n. A little bit of you should also be wondering, wait, 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 what if, when in the end I find, what if in the end I find two numbers which are both in the same interval, and one of the numbers is already 0 alpha? If one of the numbers is already 0 alpha when you start, what do you do? Suppose your pigeonhole principle gave you a 0 alpha and a something. Subashish? No? Subashish? Yep, if you get like zero alpha and something else, uh, and they're both in the same interval, you're like, well, uh, okay, thanks. The other thing is already within one over n of zero. And so you're good. Okay, I want to pause here and just ask, does anyone have any questions about this proof? This is a fairly sophisticated proof, but actually in retrospect, hopefully it's not that sophisticated. In fact, if you think, okay, it looks like we're good. Like, in fact, if you think about what we've done, it's a very, very elegant application of the pigeonhole principle. We started out by trying to find approximations to numbers, and we were amazed by pi, like 22 over 7, uh, or 355 over 113. And then after that, it was how do you go and prove that such things are possible? We had to translate it. There's a quick, uh, quick uh, overview of what we just did, because actually it's not that hard. It, it's just like, if you look at what we've done, we just found out that that approximation thing we turned into something with an n instead. Okay, but the n thing instead let us have a very simple English phrase. Is it true that all the multiples of alpha eventually um, there's like one of them that's close enough to an integer? And then the game became, let's draw. Whenever I want to know if something's close to an integer, you just start to draw everything onto a chart, uh, onto a circle, a unit circle that it keeps revolving around and, and rotating. And then the key observation is, if you ever rewinded the clock by subtracting the same alpha from both of the numbers, then the distance between them is the same. It's like geometry. So once you realize that, then it becomes, OK, let's go and pigeonhole this thing. Go and write all of these. Uh, these intervals with n intervals. And the only tricky part about this proof is to remember the 0 alpha is useful. So you throw n plus 1 dots into this place. Quick question, why did I want half open intervals? Does anyone know why I wanted to have the first one be closed and the second one be open? There's actually a reason for that. Jack. Yes, exactly. So, so what we just did is we partitioned the space. Partitioning the space means that every point of this circle is in exactly one of the pieces. If we had used all of them to be both-sided open intervals, exactly as you said, if alpha had been rational, there is a chance that at some point you go and do this, and where alpha goes ends up being like there at the zero, which is not in anything. And then suddenly the pigeonhole principle is not useful. What was useful here is we said every single point on this circle is in exactly one of these spots. And therefore, if I'm going to put n plus 1 points in here, then one of these spots, one of these um, holes or whatever, gets hit at least twice. So that's the idea. And then once you found it got hit twice, you just turn back the clock. And when you turn back the clock, eventually you get to a, a 0 and something else. And that something else is exactly what you want. Here I should also say, if people are wondering why the pigeonhole principle is called the pigeonhole principle, does anyone know? It has nothing to do with pigeons and holes. My, my joke about the pigeon having at least one hole, that's also not the one, and it's also not the one about two pigeons getting slammed in the same hole. It turns out to be because, um, I believe Dirichlet was German, but uh, in German, the pigeonhole principle is not called the birds and holes principle. In fact, pigeonhole, as one word smashed together, has an English meaning. A pigeonhole is like a mailbox. I would say like if you walk past the math department, you can see like you can put hand in your homework in the mailboxes, but I guess we don't uh, do that anymore. But anyway, it's like if you go into an office, there's like all of these mailboxes, which are all of these little holes. 
and they're all called pigeonholes because you can go and put things in them. In fact, it's called the box principle or the drawer principle. Uh, and in fact, also, a lot. This, this is often also called Dirichlet's principle because Dirichlet is the guy who, behind this theorem. This was, in fact, one of the first uh, like written applications in the math world of the pigeonhole principle. So it was actually often called Dirichlet's box principle. Of course, the pigeonhole principle has been used in other um, non-math places. It's just obvious. Um, I'm sure pigeons use it too. Uh, but but the, the bottom line is, in terms of the math world, it turns out that this particular application, which I just showed you, was one of the earliest technical proof type applications of this pigeonhole principle. Um, and it's this Dirichlet theorem. OK, so now that we have this pigeonhole principle, let's go and play with some other things that, have, that also are related to, to this fact. Um, and it's a totally, totally different theorem. So we're going to move away from this um, this particular problem and move to a different problem. So the next problem is something to do with sequences of numbers. Okay, And this, this is a theorem of Erdős and Sekerish. I'll, I'll have to spell that for you. This is the Erdős Sekerish theorem. If you look at the O, if you're doing any late, uh, LaTeX typesetting, it is not the backslash quotation mark. That backslash quotation mark is an O with just two dots on it. This is a Hungarian O, so it's backslash capital H uh, curly brace O, if you, if you care about this. But there's a story there, too, uh, because I, I believe it might have been Paul Erdős who was talking to the guy who made, uh, late, uh, who made tech uh, and convinced them to make sure to make a Hungarian accent as well, which is like, different from the, the normal, like the, the one that you see in other languages. So this is a special request that was made by a Hungarian person at the outset of tech. Actually, Erdős also is a very famous person. Uh -huh. What is this? Nepotism. Is that what you said? Nepotism? I, I don't know if that's the right word. I almost would feel like, you know, if you think about things, at some point everything was inc invented or created. And uh, if you are involved in the time when things are created, of course, there's an outsized, outsized influence. Um, but in any case, Erdős is also a very famous person. Erdős is, is, is a very... Uh, He's an inspiring mathematician to me, in fact. He was uh, quite crazy. Uh, he just, uh, he, I, I believe he was often described as the homeless, unemployed mathematician who would uh, live in other people's houses. Th this is actually true. He, he, he used to go and travel from professor's house to professor's house, live there for a few weeks, prove theorems, and, uh, and, and, and while he was at it, they would make lots and lots of collaborations. He managed to be co-authored in like close around a thousand research papers over the course of his lifetime. Really interesting guy. He was, <laughs> so a comment was made on Zoom, which I'm not echoing because I know this is, I also streamed this on YouTube. Yes, what you have said on Zoom is what I was also going to say, but I decided not to because some of the people who watch the YouTube stream are uh, under uh, 18. So, 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 so in any case, it's a very, very colorful story, very colorful story. Um, but in any case, he actually also is the, the source of something called the Erdős number. I'm not sure if you've heard of this. Most people hear about the Bacon number, the Kevin Bacon number, which is like if you star in movies, then if, uh, if you're Kevin Bacon, your Bacon number is zero. If you co-star with Kevin Bacon, your Bacon number is one. If you star with someone who stars with Kevin Bacon, your Bacon number is two. Uh, in Erdős, it's the same idea. Erdős has this idea of the Erdős number. Actually, somebody else came up with the Erdős number. If you write a paper with Erdős, your Erdős number is one. If you're a co-author of that, your Erdős number is two, and so on. So, um, and I, I'll also say that Erdős number is the motivation for Novid. Uh, for those of you who know what I'm working on nowadays, the same principle of, well, it, it, what's relevant is like how many steps you are on a graph. But we'll get to that graph theory later in this semester. Qu there was a comment. Erdős Bacon number. Yes, that's right. Sean is right. So if you actually have a finite Bacon number and a finite Erdős number. The Erdős Bacon number is the sum of the two and is finite. Um, my Erdős Bacon number is infinity because I have never co-starred in a movie. But there are some people with like particularly low Erdős Bacon numbers because they, I guess, do math and also appear in movies. Oh, somebody asked, what is my Erdős number? Um, mine is two, but that's only because I'm a combinatorialist. It doesn't mean like I'm like super good or anything. It's like if you work in the field that's closer to Erdős, you're very likely to collaborate with somebody who has an Erdős of one. I believe that there's a math professor in our department who has an Erdős of one. I, I, think, I think Alan Fries has Erdős of one. Um, I'm not entirely sure. I think so. But anyway, more comments. Teacher at the high school was explaining the mathematical 
work to Erdős. <laughs> Erdős fell asleep <laughs> while well, well doing it. Yes. Yeah, so this is a very, very interesting story. You can read all about the guy. He's a very interesting guy. Okay, back to the theorem. So erdős sekerich theorem is about, like, suppose I have n numbers, n real numbers, all distinct, given any n distinct real numbers, it says there's always going to be a monotone subsequence of at least some length. There is always, I'll have to define that word, a monotone subsequence of at least this many numbers. So we're gonna we're gonna put a we're gonna put some number there. Okay, we're gonna write that down. But first, let me give an example, and then we'll fill in that number that blank. Okay. So for an example, let's just go and write down some, some numbers. Uh, like here, here are some random numbers. 3, 1, 4, 5, 9, 2, 6. So I just wrote down like some distinct numbers. Okay, so here are some distinct numbers. And what is a monotone subsequence? Well, an example of a monotone subsequence is, uh, here's one. Uh, let me use 1, and then 5, and then 9. So 1, 5, 9 is an example of a monotone, mo monotone increasing subsequence. I'll write that here. 1, 5, 9 is monotone increasing subsequence. Okay, but actually it doesn't have to be very complete like that. You can have shorter things. You could, for example, even just say 4 and 9 is also. So it's not essential that the monotone subsequence is like maximum. You don't have to be as greedy. Monotone decreasing subsequence would be an example of that could be like, uh, what's a nice big number? Four. Four and then two. Four two is monotone decreasing subsequence. Does this make sense? The, the basic idea is monotone actually is not really keeping the same value. Monotone usually is like you, the same note, but this notion of monotone is you either always get bigger or you always get smaller. And that's either increasing or decreasing. And maybe you've noticed a subsequence here. I don't insist that the numbers are all like smashed next to each other. You can like jump over things. Oh, and another example to show how we can jump over things. Let me talk about like one and nine. One and nine is also a monotone increasing. Just emphasizing that I can I can skip over stuff. I don't have to take everything. I don't have to go one, four, five, nine. I can do one, nine. Okay. So the, the point is, it turns out that if you write down n numbers, you actually always have some like suborder inside there, which is quite interesting. It's like you can't really have n totally chaotic numbers. There will be some substructure inside. So what what what, what can we write into the blank? Well, this is an example of what's called extremal combinatorics. In extremal combinatorics, you kind of want to know r roughly what order of magnitude could I hope for? Could I hope that whenever I have n distinct real numbers, there's always going to be a monotone subsequence of at least like, I don't know, log n? Do you know what I mean? It's like, what, what could I get? What could I get? What order of magnitude? That's the interesting part of the question. And it's obvious that I can get at least one, uh, but that's because I just grabbed like one number. And the key question is, what's the right order of magnitude? Let's start by going from the other side. Whenever I'm asking a question like this to, to prove something, I want to know how good is the thing we're proving. The way to evaluate that is to say, well, what's too good to hope for? And I'm going to write the other, other side. Okay? The other side, let's write a bunch of observations. There is a sequence of n uh, distinct real numbers, rails, such that every monotone subsequence has at most 
some number of numbers. I'm claiming that these are like the flips of each other. And let's, let's, let's start with this. Um, I, I can tell you I can do it with like n in the blue blank, because that's obvious. Uh, everything, um, every monotone subsequence has at most n of the numbers. That's true. Does anyone have an interesting construction? Like an interesting way that you could line up a bunch of numbers. And, and the n, I mean, you don't have to have it for every value of n. But is there an interesting way I can make a sequence of numbers so that the monotone subsequences aren't that long? If I'm trying to make it hard, you know, if I'm, if I'm trying to make it like not many monotone, not, very, not many long monotone subsequences, how might you try to arrange n numbers out of it? That's correct. That is true. Yes. So, so actually, if you want to go and make these, uh, make these lists, you can definitely do it with like, just positive integers. And in fact, if you had any like, distinct real numbers, you could always just like, replace them with 1, 2, 3, based on which is the smallest, you call it 1, which is the second smallest, you call it 2. So you can actually do this, and we can make a, a sequence of, in fact, not just real numbers, but distinct positive integers, which, by the way, are real numbers. OK. How else can we can we can we th can we think of any interesting sequences? How how might you try to line up numbers so that they don't make very big increasing or decreasing? Ah, we've got some ideas. Civic. Um, you could start with the smallest number, smallest like the largest number, and then the second smallest number, and the uh, second largest number, and keep going. Okay, so I'm going to draw a picture. I'm drawing a graph. And the graph is going to look like this. The smallest number, the biggest number, the second smallest number, the second biggest number, third smallest number, third biggest number, and maybe the middle number. Does my graph make sense? What I'm saying is like it's like the graph of, as you're going across from left to right, it's telling you how big is your number. And so this particular sequence, let's translate it. Actually, I don't like z plus. I like it from <laughs> uh, non-negative integers. I like 0 also. So let's just do um, non-negative integers. OK, non-negative integers. And then what we have here is we have, this is 0. Oh no, how many do I have here? Is it six? I can't count. I think it's six. And then one, five, two, four, three. Yeah? So the way you think of this is you just like read it from the left to the right, and you just read like the height. That's a sequence. If you look at this, roughly what order of magnitude are you getting here? What's the longest increasing or the longest decreasing? Can anyone tell me? Just order of magnitude is close enough. It's, it's fine if you're off by one or two or something. What is Subash's construction? What's it giving us? about? Bra uh, Brayden? Yeah, it's like n over 2, OK? n over 2-ish. OK? So it's like n over 2. Maybe it's like plus 1, maybe it's minus 1. That's not important here. OK. So the question is, like, can we do better? When I talk about orders of magnitude, the order of magnitude of n over 2 is what we call linear order of magnitude. It's like n to the power 1 with some constant multiplied by it. When you want to do better, you're wondering, can I make another way of drawing a picture like this where the increasing and decreasing things are like, much more compact? I drew the picture on purpose because it's easier to think of geometrically. So I'm just going to start on the next screen. 
So here's another observation. There is a sequence of non-negative integers of length n such that every monotone subsequence has length at most. Actually, I can do it with, oh, Adivit, you have an idea? Yeah. What if you tried folding it more times? Yeah. Would that like I don't know exactly how you would like state that yet, but like you know the vague idea that I'm trying to get Yeah, you're like you, you took this thing, you kind of like it's almost like shuffling a deck of cards. It's like you, you kind of Oh that's like unshuffling a deck of cards, maybe. Or no, it is shuffling. Anyway, yeah, yeah it's, like, it's, it's like shuffling a deck of, deck of cards. You went and took your deck, you took the bottom and the top, you flipped one of them over and you shuffled it, right? Because we're short on time, I'm going to say that might work. But it turns out there's an easier way to visualize something that also works. And I'm going to draw it like stairs. I'm going to draw a picture that looks like this. OK, I need to make this line up properly. Let's do it again. And oh, oh, just so you know, I, I have some guidelines in what I'm drawing where I'm imagining that this lines up with this. Is this making sense to people? In the sense that I have these two big axes. These are my two big axes. But I'm imagining that my space is getting split up like this. And then we're doing this. Do you see what I'm doing? I, I'm, I'm making something where all the heights are different, and every x coordinate has a height. But they're like walking on stairs. Okay? And what I'm doing intentionally is over here, I have square root of n things. Over here, I have square root of n things. Over here, I have square root of n things. And I guess I'm going to do it square root of n times. Imagine that n was a perfect square. Okay, we're trying to understand things like with orders of magnitude. What does this achieve? I have like n numbers now. I have n dots. It goes up to height n. And they're in like square root of n many of these like decreasing stairs. What am I getting? Because I'm, I'm now looking at like what's the length of the longest? What's the longest monotone increasing or decreasing? What has this just done? Out of it. Yes. So you're stuck with square root of n either way, since for the increasing, you can only take 1 per downward group, and the decreasing can, on, uh, can only take an entire downward group, must stay in, must stay in a down group downward group. OK, so we've just seen a construction now. The construction is I either go one in each or on all down. And no matter what, it's like at most square root of n-ish. Uh, don't worry too much about like the, is it off by 1, is, is n in perfect square or not. We're understanding the order of magnitude, which is how we're going to think about this section. And so the answer is, it turns out that it's possible to go and make something where you don't get increasing or decreasing, which are any longer than square root of n. And it turns out that's the, best, that's the best order of magnitude of the answer. For the erdos sekerich theorem, which we're going to prove next time, it turns out that given any sequence, well, what you just saw was the worst case, in the sense that there, are, there is like a bad sequence in the world. There's a bunch of bad sequences in the world. They look like roughly like that. And those, you can't get any better than square root of n. But it turns out that if you have any n numbers, However nice or not nice, you will always be able to find a monotone subsequence of at least square root of n. And we'll do something with that next time.
I'm just going to turn off the 